Hi guys. It is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous, I do mean over the top beautiful day, here in the collapse of global industrial civilization at Bugs in a Jar Farm. Unfortunately it is a windy day, uh, so we are going to have to move inside and it is my great pleasure. I know you guys are just getting really excited to hear that Sam Mitchell is actually doing another interview for Collapse Chronicles. First interview and in, wow. Anyway, uh, bringing me back into the fold and I am thrilled to say as a good buddy of mine, uh, this is Dr. Jeremy Jimenez and Jeremy has a, he's, his doctorate is in international education from Stanford University and for the past five years he has been a professor at the State University of New York in Cortland, New York where he is a professor of foundations and social ed, advocacy. Uh, <laughs> advocacy. I can't read my own writing. He calls himself a Doomer adjacent, and we're going to find out what that means. And you might remember me mentioning Jeremy. This took me totally by surprise. I was reading, uh, when was it, a couple of weeks ago when Sandy Shellis at Environmental Coffee House also visited this a couple of days ago about this letter, this open letter to the United Nations recommending that they uh, pretty much abandon the sustainable development goals. And, and Jeremy, he was, he was one of the lead co-signatories on this and he was with some big hitters uh, including like Jim Bendel and one of my favorite collapsitarians, William Reese. So I did not even realize my own buddy was uh, was in that crowd. But anyway, we're going to welcome uh, Jeremy. Come on the show and say hello, then I'll come over there and join you. Oh, thank you for having me here at Collapse Chronicles. Great to be uh, honored to sit in the seat along with the greats like Alice Friedemann, Tim Garrett, William Rees, and and people that like to talk about meat bags and death anxiety like Sheldon <laughs> Solomon. Oh my God, I love to get Sheldon. Don't forget Sancho Panza. Oh, and Sancho Panza, of the, course, the yes. Of the Duber dog, Sancho, uh, yes. Famous okay, so I'm going to come take a seat. And this, guys, is just going to be, as all of my uh, quote interviews are, will just be a rambling conversation between a Doomer and a Doomer. It, Jason, and we're going to start with uh, that as our segue into this conversation. Let's just pick up on that letter to the United Nations regarding abandoning the sustainable development goals. How did you ever, someone with a doctorate in education, how did you find yourself in, in the league with all these doomers? So, a um, while back, uh, Jen Mendel wrote it. Earlier, I just now had a couple letters about like being more honest about the situation of looming societal collapse, and he got, there was a call out to anyone with a PhD to sign as an academic and as a scholar, and so I signed that original letter of like 500 or so scholars, and then I've just kind of been in touch over the years, and I was involved with him. There's this he has this deep adaptation environmental leadership course where he kind of encourages people to kind of speak out more if they're aware of what's happening to kind of because there's not a lot of people talking about it and uh, yeah so I, that was in March we kind of were collaborating that and through that collaboration I got more involved with like I also wrote my own piece which I guess maybe I could link on your your, your site definitely I'll like, link to as that. a side part and so yeah so I was kind of involved in that sense and that's why I got the, the co-signatory shout out. So anyway I read that letter out and I have a link to it so I'll put the link to that video and to that letter but since uh, I don't want to spend half the time we have here uh, talking about it but just give us a brief two minute recap of what you were asking the United Nations to do. So basically the overall gist of it is that the sustainable development goals have been a failure since they've been <laughs> first initiated. So some are no are good goals, right? Like reducing uh, inequality, uh, protecting life in the ocean and in the land. 
and those are good goals that have been a failure, only got worse over time. Then there are other goals they've been succeeding at are actually, I think, bad goals like economic growth and uh, pursuing bright green light, clean energy. Uh, and then there's kind of more mixed ones like education. Like you have education, yeah, you might have more people enrolled in school, but what are they doing? Like what happens if you take someone from like rural India who actually knows how to be an organic farmer and you convince him to enroll in school so he can work in the commercial sector, you know, which not only is that like contributing to more consumerism, but it might be losing that kind of family indigenous skills of how to live with the land and work in the land. And when the fossil fuels go away, you know, those consumer jobs will be pointless and useless and they will have, you know, a lot of those people will have lost those valuable organic farming skills. So, yeah, so, so the, the goals that have been succeeding are actually goals I think are harmful to the planet and the ones that would be beneficial social justice goals have been uh, greatly failing so that's why motivation for the letter there you go those are those are many good many good reasons so i can't remember who it was that derek jensen interviewed i think it was i need to find that interview in the mid 1990s he was predicting in the 21st century that the words the very notion of sustainable development was going to be the oxymoron of the 21st century. Do you think whoever that fellow was making that prediction is sustainable development the oxymoron of the 21st century? Yeah, I mean, I certainly have a lot of sympathy with Derek Jensen's view of uh, welcoming on the, the collapse, because uh, obviously every year industrial, civil, industrial, industrial civilization is not sustainable, it's never been sustainable. Every additional year of industrial civilization is more global warming, more poisoning of the rivers and the oceans, um, more habitat loss. So yeah, so in that sense, uh, you know, to be in favor of collapse or not to favor of collapse, that is the question. Uh, whether to snowbird to suffer the slings and arrows of ongoing collapse or make haste to the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Uh, there's the rub. Yes, uh, which, that is the rub. Uh, which conservation devoutly to be <laughs> desired. Um, but yeah, no, I think so. I, I certainly sympathize with that view, but of course, I think you, you've talked about and others have talked about how during the pandemic, with the sudden shutdown of global industrial civilization, a lot of people dependent on foreign income and support have had to turn to deforestation and killing wildlife to make a living. So and they eat. Right. So I guess I'd be more in a favor of a kind of gradual shutdown of global industrial civilization. Uh, so uh, yeah, and I guess... That would kind of go to where I would call myself Doomer adjacent, and I think we have a choice between a, a future that is hard and horror, and I guess I would like to be part of the advocacy for those pushing closer to the hard future rather than the horror future, <laughs> and the fact that I make a distinction between hard and horror I guess puts me Doomer adjacent, um, even if in fact the, the horror is inevitable eventually, I mean if we can have 20 to 30 years of hard rather than horror, there's value yeah. in that, you know. I I, ha I love my nephew and niece, and I love you know people and other species. And if we could all suffer less, I think that would be great. And uh, yeah, but obviously, sustainable development, as it's in you know with industrial growth and and technology and all that, is never been sustainable. And uh, yeah, we need to just let it go. Just, just let it go. Let just go. just real quick, what is what is your call on this Antonio Guterres dude? Uh, is he speaking from the heart? I mean, he's the biggest. He's turned into the biggest doomer I on know, the planet. Yeah. yeah, the United Nations, in my opinion, is is, is the single biggest collection of planet eaters. Uh, you know, this side of Davos, Switzerland. Well, yeah, I mean, so I what's think, going on? Yeah, I think. I mean, they think there's pro there's a lot. There must be a lot of well-meaning, well-intentioned people in the UN and in the various <laughs> NGOs and agencies. But uh, yeah, they they are hesitant to come out fully against this because it's the operating paradigm. And Tony Gutierrez himself, yeah, on one hand, yeah, he's, he's been sounded much like a doomer in his pronouncements of the future, but like one thing, I guess, what I think is the step he needs to go further is uh, you'll always hear people say like, we need to end fossil fuels, right? We need to end fossil fuels, but what does that mean, right? Like when you end fossil fuels, you end, for example, the Haber-Bosch process. The Haber-Bosch process is like responsible for 1.8% of global emissions, but it's also responsible <laughs> for about half of the calories consumed <laughs> in the world. So like, yeah, we need to end fossil fuels because of global warming, but like when you end it, there's like serious consequences. And so I think a lot of people will, uh, say end fossil fuels but not be specific what that means like ending fossil fuels does mean the end of modern life as we know it and uh and again like derek jensen would certainly be a fan of that and certainly many ecosystems would be a fan of that but um but yeah but it's it's we, you, you take it the step further i think is when you actually interrogate what end fossil fuels means that's when you get into the really hard 
uh, dilemma, predicament to face. What do you think is a chance we are going to uh, get off, wean, wean <laughs> ourselves off of fossil fuels before we burn? We're, we're, this is the frying pan versus right. the fire. And I, you, you said, I uh, can't remember what you said a few minutes, the hard versus the horror. Yeah. I call it the frying pan of the fire. We have the frying pan of fossil fuels or the fire of the bright green lies. I mean, e e either way, uh, it, it's... There's so many of these uh, frying pan versus the fire conundrums that that we're up against. So, are is there any chance of us weaning off of fossil fuels before uh, we fall from the frying pan into the fire? Does that make any difference at this point? Uh, I mean, yeah, I'd probably consider myself in the Tim Garrett school of uh, yeah, we're gonna basically use all the energy. That's uh, what what humans do. We have available energy. We're gonna burn it. If, if what makes me doomer adjacent rather than full on doomer is I'd like if we, since I do think we are going to burn all the fossil fuels, if we can allocate some of that burning to a post fossil fuel future, like, again, it's not going to save us, but the more we can get like the infrastructure set up for people to begin organic gardening, to learn about foraging, to get back some of those indigenous ways of understanding what are the plants you can eat, what are the plants you can't eat. Like then that involves education, et cetera, and training uh, and, and distribution of seeds. Like I'd like some of that fossil fuels to be used for that positive post adaptation purposes, but yeah, actually weaning off, like leaving them in the ground. Yeah, I don't really see that realistically happening. All the signs would point to the contrary to me. So the the flip side, which I guess Antonio is still pushing, what's your spin on the on the bright green lies of renew clean green renewable energy saving the planet? Yeah, that's uh, that just baffles me that like <laughs> uh, that. I mean, it's so, if you just take a little time to read a little bit of it, like, you know, you can narrowly make the argument that the solar panels, maybe over 20 years, you've reduced fossil fuel uses, but such a narrow way to look at it. You're not looking at uh, all the toxic mining and the poisoning of the rivers. You're not looking about the fact that they're not actually renewable. You know, you have to just build them again, all the toxic waste involved. Uh, the fact that you're fully dependent on the fossil fuel industry to, you know, mine, manufacture, distribute. Uh, assemble, deliver, um, take apart. Uh, so yeah, it's and in fact, you know, going again, referencing Tim Garrett again, like in Jevard's Paradox, which I'm sure you yeah. listeners of your uh, channel know very well. Um, well, tell us what Jevons Paradox is in, in a sentence for those who... So yeah, so William Stanley Jevons was, uh, I think he was a British thinker, and he was uh, talked about how Everyone was emphasizing efficiency, this idea like, well, if you just make things more efficient, we'll consume less. And he's saying like, no, actually, the, the opposite is going to happen. Because when you make things more efficient, you make them more affordable. When you make them more affordable, without restrictions on their usage, people are going to use them more. And so the idea of applying to things like renewable energy is like, even if it was arguably better in terms of on net global emissions, et cetera, um, you're just adding to the energy mix. So if you don't actually restrict fossil fuel usage, rather, you know, there's an assumption, I think, you're going to use these solar panels to crowd out fossil yeah, fuel yeah, energy, but no, yeah. what actually happens is yeah, you just yeah. add energy on top, yep. and you just more more consumption, more damage. So, yeah, if there's any value to renewable energy, it's if, you know, you're, you're living off, trying to live off-grid, and you want to have some access to power when the grid goes down for some years, uh, that's positive, uh, yeah, but otherwise, it's, uh, it's just more environmental damage, I think. Yeah. So, are you, Andy the gardener and I are the only two people who have ever mentioned that. You and I have never had that. I've never had this conversation with Jeremy, so I'm interested to hear his answer. Okay, the ultimate goal, we, tomorrow the space aliens land, mm -hmm. and they give humanity, literally, an unlimited supply of free green, clean energy, would that save the planet? That would be an absolute nightmare. <laughs> uh, all right, you got, why would that be? Because that everyone is, that's the holy grail uh, of so many people. Uh, you know, a lot of the conspiracy theorists about how the fossil fuel uh, people are killing all these people, bringing in all of this free, free energy. Why would that be a catastrophe to give a, a bunch of naked apes, uh, a limitless supply of... 
Well, so actually, my, energy. Uh, so actually, recently I did some research in Singapore, interviewing teachers about how they teach about you know the direness of climate change. I was actually quote one of the teachers, and I could send the link to the open access paper. But he was like, "Yeah, what happens if we had free, unlimited energy? Well, we'd have like the Star Wars planet, right? Yeah. You just have like an entire planet of like industry, and you'd have kill all the wildlife because that energy it makes it available to destroy things. Exactly. And, you know, and uh, yeah, so I mean, in theory, if there was was actually like a benevolent rational state or government that can oversee its usage to not destroy it was like hey we got clean energy now we don't have to cut down those trees to burn wood in theory that could be good but again practice is has been like other than uh some some indigenous communities if you have energy you're going to destroy your environment and unfortunately most of the world is not indigenous so oh it would i i, I... I, I think it's the inefficiency of all energy sources, right. Right? fossil fuels and every other. That the, slows it, down. It's the uh, inefficiency yeah. of them that, that is holding, that right. is putting yeah, yeah, the yeah. brakes on. Uh, I mean, it's just like we're having a gypsy worm invasion here. Just, just like t turning loose the gypsy worms uh, on the planet, arming 8 billion uh, Eight billion gypsy worms with, with yeah. you know, we would make chainsaws and bulldozers yeah. out of it, is what yeah. we do anyway. Yeah, and I think, yeah, the, what's um, <laughs> that I'm sorry, go ahead, yeah, go ahead. Well, okay, so I, I brought up eight billion, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, Jeremy is the only thing is he told me to behave myself a little <laughs> bit on the on the uh, overpopulation, uh, but. I think this is a, a fair question. Can we have a sustainable anything on the planet with at least what I consider to be an outrageously unsustainable number of humans making demand? Is it possible sustainable anything on planet Earth with eight billion people? Uh, you know what I'm saying? Yes. Looking for a piece of the pie. Uh, yeah, it's hard to see that path forward, uh, especially if coupled with that is anything resembling kind of the modern life and amenities we've become accustomed to. Uh, yeah, no, it's, um, yeah, and however many people are on the planet, um, they will just make all the environmental problems worse, you know, much to the contrast of Elon Musk's vision. Uh, yeah, if there's more people, it just puts more strain on all systems. And, uh, and again, going back to the Haber Bosch, like, there's only, you know, the reason why a lot of people gave a lot of heat to Paul Ehrlich for being wrong was because uh, of the Haber Bosch process, right? Like, the Haber Bosch process bought us some more decades before facing the, you know, the disconnect between resource availability and human population. And, uh, yeah, but the Haber Bosch process is fossil fuel intensive and destroys soil and destroys biodiversity. So, um, yeah, no, I think, uh, well, I'll be one to echo that, that yes, I think it's certainly not going to happen fast enough, but pushing for women's rights does encourage less human births, and that is a positive way to would give agency to women um, to make choices they generally have historically chosen to have less children when patriarchy is taken out of the picture. So, yeah, that would be great to have that as an advocacy to lower population, but, yeah, 8 billion is, uh, is, is a lot for sure. It's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Do you, I, I, any anything else you want to say on that? Uh, uh, I, I'm just since I'm I, I, I don't want to ask a specific question right, that right. will get you in trouble. Uh, just oh okay, yeah, well, I guess I, I could talk. What I can think of talk about is maybe um, why I think so few people, academic scholars, are willing to talk about uh, population. Um, Oh, and the most is academics, is the media, sure, yeah, is yeah. the United Nations. Uh, why is it such a third rail subject? So I think so. First, we have to acknowledge that there is a lot of real racist history associated with those. First, you go back to the like colonial empires. A lot of colonial empires, like you know, there was like the pro natalist Catholics in France, wanted people in their colonies to have a lot of children. They actually encouraged them to have a lot of children because they wanted cheap labor and they wanted, or in some cases, spread the faith. So when you have a lot of people in countries with high population rates, we have to be honest, some of that was the responsibility of like European colonial regimes. 
also in the racist history of the more recently is like you have like a lot of foundations of 20th century pushed Asian countries to put in population controls, but they didn't say anything about Europe or North Americans or rich countries, right? And so that goes back to that confluence between it's not just population, it's also resource consumption technology use. And so I think a lot of people are like, oh, if you just focus on population, you're not, you're not acknowledging the fact that a U.S. child is much more damaging to the world than a family in rural Mali, for example. Um, and of course you have more recently the mass shooters, right? Like a lot of them in their racist manifestos, they're like, they're not targeting all humans. They're killing people of color. They're keeping Muslims, Latinos, black people being motivated by these racist manifestos. So there is a very real racist history associated with overpopulation that I think people afraid to be labeled a racist or considered a racist because they're not able to articulate it clearly or they don't feel they have the time to articulate it clearly, they just avoid it altogether. Then there's also biases within like academic publishing. Like I know for example I publish things where I might just very briefly mention population as part of something. And then as part of the review process the reviewers will be like, well no it's really not about population, it's about technology consumption. And like they're the gatekeepers, right? So like if they if you want to publish a paper and your paper your contingent on your academic success and promotion and keeping your job is getting publications well you might just be like well I, it's okay I don't need to fight for that one line it's not that important like I'd rather get my paper published and then of course if if you're not finding population discussed in papers well what informs you you're informed by what you're reading so if you're constantly reading things about the environment and it's never coming up like it used to come up back in the 70s you're just not influenced but there were by half it. as many people I yeah think. yeah exactly yeah <laughs> so it's just not in your head as a thing to even think to mention because no one else is talking about it so i think those are some of the reasons why people are reticent to talk about it but it's unfortunate because i think you know it's clearly one of the key levers and some people like alan weissman william reese have been more open and willing to um, yeah, discuss it. Just for the record, this man is not a breeder. And I am not a breeder. Uh, you're how old now? I uh, 45. Yep. 45, and you haven't let one out of the oven yet. I have not. So, no. To, uh, to be fair, like <laughs> initially, I had little to do with uh, environmental reasons, and more to do with. Uh, Traveling, I'll take this time to confess that I am a climate criminal. Uh, I have uh, visited 160 countries of the world. I decided not to get attached and have a family because I enjoy the wandering life. So again, for the record, I'm confessing my climate crimes here for the future tribunals of, uh, of the fossil fuel trials. Um, but yeah, so initially it was just like I liked my freedom in my life and I didn't want to get like bogged down, trapped anywhere. But uh, as I became more aware of the impacts of uh, population um yeah i, I kind of like well i should probably even though i do generally i love my nephew and niece and i love playing with children i realize yeah i shouldn't probably make another one and unfortunately there's been some good relationships that have, have not lasted because of that difference of views on uh having children but yeah no no children in the past and hopefully no children in the future <laughs> <laughs> well there's there's a couple of ways to there are yes I know yes there, there is what there is a yes and um it I, takes about 20 minutes I know it about I know. 300 dollars dude I did it myself <laughs> at age 20 I'm waiting I'm waiting for the best decision I ever made <laughs> I'm waiting for the public subsidy I'm waiting for like when uh, uh, the governments are like we were willing to citizens that are willing to control <laughs> we will pay you a thousand dollars to link so I'm holding out for the subsidy yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's like well, the people right. holding out for the vaccines like oh I'll wait for them to pay me a hundred dollars <laughs> to get the vaccine <laughs> I think Walmart pays 150 of their employees. <laughs> All right, so I anyway, just so, so you know, this man is not a breeder. Well, let's, uh, good Lord, again, this this conversation, we, we could go so many areas, but since this man is a, uh, since he is a professor, I, I mean, you spend your life uh, sharing your your great wisdom about the state of the planet, with let's face it, eighteen to twenty-two year olds. Yeah, mostly. So, uh, tell us, tell us about that. Tell us what your honest opinion. So you're forty-five. So you're talking to someone twenty years old, and you're thinking about them when they're your age. What would that be? Uh, twenty forty-seven. What is your vision of the year 2047 that your students will be living? Uh, 
Well, yeah, but first I'm lucky in that I don't actually specifically teach, like, I'm not, I wasn't hired to teach about environmental ecological issues. Like, I incorporate that into my classes because I think it's important, and I think, in, you know, I do teach race, class, gender issues, and environmental justice certainly fits with that. So it's not as if, like, I'm, it's my responsibility to teach about this. I just incorporate it. But, yeah, so I, I guess when I do do my brief discussions of it, I do this kind of going back to the hard and the horror, right? Like, I kind of say, like, these these are our future. The future is a mix between hard and horror. And uh, the extent to which we individually and collectively acknowledge that and make adjustments to that, like, we can make the transition closer to hard and not so much horror. Um, but, yeah, it's tough. I, I think when I remember when I first would teach just like an overview of climate change when I first started working five years ago, I remember students would cry, like, like tear in their eyes when like just discussing like what are the possibilities of what could happen. Um, but it's interesting, more recently when I've taught about it, and of course the stats are worse, right? Like I up to date my presentation every year and it's much worse, all the individual data. But there is almost a numbness, I kind of sense, where they're kind of like, and it probably is kind of related to COVID and all the various other crises. Like, yeah, and there's not a lot of good news to be found anywhere. So it's interesting, like more recently I teach it, it's almost this kind of like, um, yeah, no, but this is not surprising. Like, yep, no, I expected that. And it's kind of interesting, we talk about like populations that are um, honest, like honestly assessing the future. I kind of feel it's like that middle middle age group, like people in the 30s, 40s, 50s, like they're the most likely to be in denial. Cause like, and I, interesting the reasons why. So young people on one hand, they've, their whole life, they've only kind of had this kind of doom messaging, right? Through like social media and movies, like the Marvel films. So there, it's always kind of been surrounded by them, like things are gonna be hard. So I think they are kind of more open to that reality. And on the older side, it's kind of interesting, and maybe, of course, you, you could comment for yourself, but I always find it interesting, if you look at people that kind of comment and participate on, like, the Doomer channels, they do kind of skew old. And is that more, like, because they're retired and they have free time to look at things? Is it more, if you're closer to your own mortality, you can kind of be open to the fact that, like, things aren't, aren't so good? Or is it more just, I remember I was scuba diving uh, when I was in my late 30s, and I, was, I went back to a reef I visited 20 years earlier, and I was commenting to this, like, young couple like oh you should have seen this like 20 years ago and then this older guy was like oh you should have seen it 40 years ago yeah. right so i think if you're older you've just seen so much change like going back to the right. childhood ponds that you could just oh no how could you not how could you deny it because of how much i've seen but it's that middle range where i find the kind of most resistance and maybe it's because if you were like in your 30s 40s 50s you actually grew up sold a vision of like oh you're gonna have a nice retirement and you're gonna have a pension and the future is bright and it's harder to let go of that. And you, or maybe you have children yourself, right? And what's worse than for a parent to think about that the future is going to be worse for them, right? Like even if you're in a war, you can tell yourselves the war will end yeah. and things will get better. But if you're looking at the the future of our planet, like there's a lot, not a lot of room for optimism. So I think, yeah, there's that kind of resistance is in that kind of middle age group. Which and I, yeah, it'd be interesting to do a study, like a systematic study. I'm just kind of commenting anecdotally. But uh, yeah, if there's like more resistance in that group. But, uh, but anyway, going back to the question, yeah, what does 2047 look like? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, is it Dennis Meadows? He was one of the original authors of the Limits of Growth. He was on an interview recently, I listened to him, and he says he actually doesn't talk about it with young people anymore because he can't be honest. Like he feels it's too hard to be honest, yeah. so he avoids it. I don't have that luxury. I, I do teach and I, I do think they should know. But I guess I do my best to say, Hard is better than horror. And there are ways in which even if it's hard is better. Like we all get really annoyed about all this like social media nonsense, right? And like a lot of the things in modern life suck. Like we're no longer like gathering around the campfire and singing songs and playing games. So like I think a lot of modern life is stressful unnecessarily. And so I, if I do any kind of like way to put a positive spin, I'm like there are things that are better when we get rid of this oppressive modern structure kind of controlling us and monitoring us and surveilling us all the time. It doesn't mean necessarily that overall things are great because you're gonna be struggling more to find food, no doubt, but there's ways to kind of like think about what could be more positive when, you know, we no longer have this system, you know, over us. But yeah, but it's, yeah, it's hard. And I, I don't know what 2047 looks like. I just know it'll be a, it'll be a struggle. Yeah. So you will be, 
How old will you be in 2047? So that's about, yeah, 25 years from now. So uh, I'll be uh, 70? 70, yeah. 70 Collecting my old. pension. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Inshallah. <laughs> Do you think so? <laughs> uh, not likely, no, but you got to hedge your bets, right? Because, so, again, I think a lot of people who have, like, like us who have been studying this for a while, you know, we're always surprised. Oh, things haven't fallen apart yet. Like, it's still, still kicking somehow. And um, so, yeah, who knows? That's, uh, I'm certainly not investing a lot into my pension, but I, <laughs> I'm doing the minimum, doing the, the bare minimum to uh, have something in case. Yeah. So you are obviously not a, not, not a hopium addict. I mean, where, where, where are you on the apocalyptimism line? Yourself. Uh, yeah, so I guess why one of the ways I think about hope versus doom, the way I think about like vaccines, right? Like vaccine neutral. You want a vaccine? Get a vaccine. You don't want a vaccine? No, get a vaccine. So same with hope and doom. You want to have hope that fills you back? <laughs> All right, dude, have hope. You want to be doomer? Like that works, man. Go for it. I just I get frustrated when one camp insists the other camp yeah. needs to be. And understandably, I think the doomer is a reaction against those who keep saying, like, you have to have hope. And yeah, what I find is there's this line that keeps getting repeated that, like, well, if there's no hope, there's no way you'd, you'd have action. And, and look, I don't want to toot my own horn. I do the bare minimum, but I, like, have five composting bins. I have, like, two outdoor bird's nest bins. I have a tumbler <laughs> bin. I have a bocaccia bin. I have a worm bin. Uh, just I think it's so important restoring soil help the soil, like, and just kind of, like, modeling that and teaching about that. But I don't think I'm going to save the planet or anyone's going to save the planet by composting. But my point is that I think so many will say, like, if you give up hope, you're not going to do any action. And that's not been my experience. I think a lot of people that accept the reality of it are like, well, no, I can make things less bad. And that's good. Or it just, just feels good to me to do it. Or, like, it's the least I can do to generations and other species that are coming to, like... So, yeah, I get frustrated by people who claim without evidence that, like, if you don't have hope, you won't engage in action. Because, um, yeah, I think I've seen people with hope that engage in action and don't engage in action. I've seen people that are doomers that engage in action and don't engage in action. So, yeah, I guess those... And then there's the other 95 percent of they're just planet. no idea yeah, <laughs> well, no, it, it was totally never oblivious it, yeah, completely yeah. oblivious has right. never considered the whole subject on which side of the divide to be on because they don't care yeah it's I, never crossed their mind right. uh that this whole subject that we talk about that trouble's coming uh, that yeah. there's some vague notion that there's something wrong with the climate talk about uh where, where do you weigh in uh, on the on the nine planetary boundaries? I'm sure you know our our friend Book Hermit, who uh, I, I always I always like to have I like to have fun with Book Hermit. I think he's a little bit the climate change denial, but I but I think the man is right, and I agree. I'm always defending this dude that. Climate change is one of the nine planetary, and there's still eight of that. Of do, you, do you agree with this statement? If climate change was nowhere on the map, nowhere on the map, uh, that humans were making zero their zero difference to the climate. Would that save the planet? Uh, yeah, no, I would be in the camp that says, even without climate change, like we're in serious trouble with ecosystem degradation and, yeah. and nitrogen cycle disruption and ocean acidification. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm actually right, trying to write a piece right now where I, I talk, yeah, I kind of point out why are we all talking about only climate yeah, change? Yeah. And my, my thought, my speculation is that like climate change is the one problem that involves more. Like, it's like, oh, we can solve it by building more solar panels. We can solve it by carbon capture and storage. We can solve it by putting, stra you know, shooting up <laughs> uh, sulfates in the stratosphere. So if we can solve it by inventing more stuff, right? So I think it, it, it invites this idea that you can kind of, like, do more stuff to solve the problem. And that way there's more jobs and there's more careers and there's more inventions and there's more public speaking and there's more grants, right? All that. The rest of them are all like, do less. Like, <laughs> no, just like leave the forest alone. <laughs> and just like stop taking the fish out of the ocean, the bottom of the ocean and destroying the whole ocean bottom. So I think, yeah, I think the climate change focus could be in my speculation that um, 
it invites actually business as usual and deluding people to think business as usual industrial development can address it. And the ways the other ones are less sexy, like, yeah, just kind of uh. back off and kind of let things be, you know, or just maybe, you know, the very ancient indigenous land management, right? Not kind of like trying to like invent our way out of this. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I just wonder what percentage of people on the planet even realize there are. And I think there's a hell of a lot yeah. more than nine. I don't know where they, how they whittle that number down to nine. I can think of 900 just off the top of my head. Well, I don't know if you saw, did you see that <laughs> Netflix documentary about the nine planetary boundaries? Oh, yeah, I need, I need to rewatch that. Well, it's interesting because like, it's like full on that. doomer for like the first yeah, hour yeah, and a half. Yeah, like, yeah. And like and the music and the yeah. drama yeah. and the people marching <laughs> off the cliff to the red zone. And then, but in the end, like, and they just, yeah. that same rap, I'm like, but you know, we got some solar panels over there. <laughs> and uh, I think there's some guy organic gardening over there. So we're gonna, I think we're gonna put this together. And it's just like, uh, it's really interesting that your last, that wrap up, that need for the, the hopium wrap up really yeah. contradicts everything that came. Cause yeah, the, the way it even like, it talks about the boundaries, like when you get to a a certain point of like species loss you don't reverse that you know you don't reverse that in human lifestyles right it's it, they're gone and you don't like back off from that right so yeah it's it's very frustrating that that they are very honest in their initial assessment but then they put the unrealistic uh, spin at the end yeah. uh, to put it well they they need to get on Netflix Right, I guess so, yeah. Although, Don't Look Up, right? That, yeah, that, 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 that had a, uh, a pop, and that was very popular, right? That's an evidence that you can uh, go full on in a doomer message and still get people to tune in. So, so as I say, I, I never even realized they were talking about climate change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, I'm a crazy me. I, I thought they were talking about all nine of them, one and one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and like all of these reviews, like yeah. about this movie yeah. about climate, and I go, what? That's what? Yeah, that was yeah. a movie about climate change. I thought it was a movie about all nine of them. And the reason is, is because 99% of movie reviewers, they've never heard of the other eight. Either. Right, yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. so that's what turned that movie into a movie about climate change, because there are not eight others. And, and the activists too, right? Again, no, no, props to all activists that are putting their bodies on the line. But um, yeah, that often is climate change is what the messaging is, right? And it's not about the broader broader. Not all activists, obviously, but yeah. That, or maybe that's just what gets the attention. Maybe they, there's plenty of activists going for all, but climate change is in the news, so when they co when they do rarely cover it, they cover the people focusing on climate change. Yeah. And they're certainly never going to talk about uh, dem demand-driven solutions instead of supply, like lowering right, yeah. the demands on right. the planet yeah. by lowering the number of units making demands uh -huh. on the planet and their consumption <laughs> it's all about supply supply so it's just it's just yeah. you know it's just a given that there's going to be 10 billion or 12 billion people on the planet and how are we we're, that that's just an automatic assumption and, and and nobody suggesting maybe we can approach this from the demand side by reducing the population because then you get into good lord Right. Then you dark, get into Georgia dark, Guidestone territory. Yeah, and, and dark eco-fascism and yes, yeah, all that. Yes, you are. Uh, are you a fan of the Georgia Guidestones? Are you familiar? I only them? I only know them from you having mentioned them earlier. <laughs> so yeah, I um I don't I've never visited them. I've yeah so, yeah I don't really yeah. I went. finally made it there about a year ago. Well, the, the, of course the the number one one. Maintain a global population of 500 million. When, and when were they built? The, the 1970. 1970. In Georgia. Yeah. yeah. People think Ted Turner is the one who uh, funded it, or yeah, oh. he, he's the prime suspect. Oh. Of course, then he went on to have five children. Uh, if he was the one, oh. he's certainly a uh, shining beacon. Uh, well. Let's talk about Oh, and we got uh, watching... 15, 15 ish minutes. Okay, uh, we're, we're going to switch gears here because he mentioned uh, this is just some, uh, more some personal uh, st uh, anecdotes here. How many countries have you visited? <laughs> 160. So I can imagine your carbon footprint from, from that. Pretty high. <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty high. Yeah. Of course, I rationalize it. I'm like, well, you know, I uh, I supported local communities, and I can find ways to teach about it, and I learn clearly. 
actually really learn about how terrible environmental issues are in countries. You know, in Namibia, I've gone to Namibia and people tell me, like, oh yeah, we think there's not going to be any water here in 10 years. I'm like, oh, well, interesting. No one's even talking well, about it. Well, that's where I was going with this. So you've yeah. been to 160. Uh, what country is number 160 uh, on, or either either number one, uh, the most doomed oh. country out of the 160, or from the other end of the spectrum? You know what? You, yeah. You know the question I'm asking. Which out of the 160 countries, which is the one you would least like to live in? To be trapped in with. Uh, <laughs> to be trapped in the rest of your. Uh, life. Yeah. You were glad to get the hell out. <laughs> well, yeah, it's funny. I, I I live here now in upstate New York, but I grew up in New Jersey, and I kind of feel like I'm at home because the climate here now is like what it was when I was a child in New Jersey. So it almost feels like I'm returned home. But uh, yeah, well, so just thinking of like. You know, global warming and water availability, I would want to avoid countries that do not have a lot of water, so, and suffer from a lot of heat. So I suppose <laughs> um, Southwest Asian countries, what many call the Middle East, that don't have oil would be countries I would want to avoid. And uh, and I, I, I actually travel to most countries in, in the Middle East, and really lovely people, really hospitable, but yeah, it's... Uh, it's hard to go there and knowing what I know about like water availability and resources and uh, to be to think about what's going to happen in those large cities. So yeah, I think um, that's yeah. I would. So, so the Middle East is probably is it is it going to be the first area of the planet declared uninhabitable? Possibly, but you know, they, as long as the Saudi Arabian countries have oil, right, then they still can air conditioning. Like yeah. <laughs> they can get by on air conditioning to not you know, experience heat death, and they can still import food. So that's why I would say it's the countries without, like, domestic oil reserves that would be the really ones troubled. But, uh, I mean, I think we're already seeing, right, with the migration into Europe, like, people are realizing they're having trouble growing food, farmers, so, yeah, they're... they're, they're How extensively have you traveled in Sub-Saharan Africa? Uh, yeah, a good bunch. I don't know, maybe... Uh, 25 or so countries of Southern Africa. Yeah, most most of almost all the south, east, some of the west, a uh, little. When central. was the last time you were over there? Uh, when was that last time? I was in. Oh, right before the pandemic, I was in Equatorial Guinea, Gabon. Um, it was actually yeah, in Equatorial Guinea. We went to. Um, yeah, and kind of adding to like the ecosystem degradation, we went to see these turtles hatching at night, and. Um, you know, you're, you're saying, yeah, usually we see several turtles, like, you know, burying their eggs uh, or whatever. And uh, we walked all night. We didn't see any. Until, like, 2 in the morning, we saw a species which doesn't belong there. Which was, yeah, I think it was like, a, what was it, like, um, I forget the species it was. But it was like, we did see one, but the guy was like, yo, this is kind of cool because you don't ever I see this species at this beach. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so, Equatorian Guinea, Gabon, uh, uh, Ivory Coast, um, and uh, yeah, that's where I went. What was your general impression of, uh, uh, about their ecological futures in that corner of the world? Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it was hot and dusty. Uh, it was really uh, like, I mean, Gabon's kind of really gorgeous still. Gabon is fairly undeveloped in the modern industrial sense. It's got a lot of green and forests, which are really lovely. So, but of course, Gabon has oil, and they're able to kind of fund themselves. So, go, yeah, if you go to Gabon, it actually feels like a pretty, like, nice place. All right. Uh, same with Equatorial Guinea. Equatorial Guinea is so much oil, totally, even though it's a very, you know, corrupt government that, you know, doesn't share its resources widely. Um, yeah, there are some countries that you can have the illusion that, like, things look like they're fine, but if you know the, the yeah. kind of broader ecosystem damage and global warming, like, yeah, tr trouble's coming. Sure. How about Nigeria? Did you make it over? Just, uh, just transferred uh, plane. Oh, really? Nigeria. You haven't spent any time in Nigeria? Nigeria's Canada. really hard to get a visa to, yeah. Understandably, we in the United States make it very difficult for people to come here, yeah. so you can't blame them, but yeah. like, it's like an arm and a leg to get like a visa to oh. Nigeria. Yeah, most places you can just like, it's either you just show up or you do the online easy visa thing, but no, Nigeria's really hard to get a visa. Yeah, this article I just mentioned briefly yesterday there are no, what was the title of it there are now more loggers than trees in Nigeria really? as far as well yeah uh, yeah Nigeria is um yeah that's that's well I used to always say that was the poster child of of the where the collapse is going to begin but I think I'm moving to Somalia with my so what is your so I, I know you're keeping up with all of this stuff 
What's your, what do you think we're going to see over the next few months going on in Somalia and the Horn of Africa with the famines and stuff? Uh, yeah, I can't. I definitely have no position to know enough to make any solid predictions. Um, I suspect that, you know, relief agencies will do their best to mitigate uh, food insecurity and famine. Um, but, uh, yeah, especially with the Ukraine-Russia war and cut off of Ukraine's, like, grain deliveries. Um, yeah, there's a... Uh, the, the near future is quite uncertain, and uh, I make no predictions, but uh, other than that, like, you know, buckle up is all I can say to that. And be glad you don't live in Somalia. Yeah, and again, I spent, I visited Somalia, and I, so just really quickly, I was, um, well, I was there with my brother, and we were meant to fly out, and we got to the airport, they're like, we had to cancel the flight because you two were the only people on the plane. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so then the CEO of the airline, Jiva Airways in Somalia, he came to pick me up at the airport. I was like, I'm really sorry, you know, we, had, we, did it, we could have justified the flight, but we'll put you on a small plane on another airline later today. But in the meantime, I'll take you out to lunch, I'll give you a tour of the city. And he yeah, took me to lunch, took me to the uh, Obama restaurant in the in Obama Hargeisa. restaurant? Yeah, it's in northern Somalia, in Hargeisa, uh, yes. Um, <laughs> And, uh, yeah, it was great. Like, so, like, you know, it's sad because really hospitable people uh, in Somalia and Sub-Saharan Africa broadly. And, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, you can, uh, there's that, what's called, like, emotion fatigue or co co compassion fatigue. Uh, yeah, I, I, I... Donor fatigue. Yeah, well, just in general, like, when you yeah. know enough about what's happening, I do try to actually turn off the doom scrolling because I'm, like, powerless to think about, like, how children are not eating in Madagascar and stuff so I just tend yeah I guess in my the way I kind of feel better is, is I advocate for the indigenous organic gardening because that's what's gonna have to happen when the fossil fuels are gone right when the fossil fuels are gone and there's no more ships bringing in food all the best you could hope for is kind of like land restoration and yeah and it's a tall order and uh, I don't I certainly don't have a positive and, assessment but the the Better hard than horror, as we can must. And the inconvenient truth that organic gardening methods, I think, supported a maximum population right. of about one billion people. Well, to be fair, there are organic gardeners who grow a whole field of corn and then just throw they it totally in the river. Know, they can't so what we what? need is those organic gardeners they, they, they to get, well, I, be I, better I, advocates for their produce and where they can share their produce. I, I think Jeremy was, was the <laughs> only person I know who actually came over and, and grabbed some of my beautiful uh, homegrown organic produce before I threw it in the creek and fed the beavers and the deer with it. And in fact, I took your cow and replanted it, and it's actually coming up again in my raised bed right now. All some right. of your cow, so yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> you ain't going to find any out there this year. Uh, so anyway, I, I know... Oh, we got uh, uh, eight minutes. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I, I will reframe my my usual closer since I have a uh, since I have a college professor next to me okay so it's after class and, and so you're finished talking about whatever and some uh, let's say a 19 year old mm -hmm. uh, is hanging around looking kind of gloomy and uh, more and more common these days uh, yeah and, and, and once to talk to you about their future and what they have to look forward to and what they can do what what would your advice as a as a doomer adjacent college professor in the year 2022 to a depressed uh, collapsitarian 19 year old about about their future what what would you tell them uh, so they're probably most likely an education student because I teach mostly future teachers. Um, so I would tell them to stay the course for being a teacher. We don't, fundamentals uncertainty, we don't know how long things can last, right? Like, and I think it was a Joanna Macy who talks about, like, we just have to all come to terms with, like, impermanence, right? Nothing lasts forever. So nothing ever has lasted forever. Um, that, and that, of course, will include uh, global industrial society. But in the meantime, we don't know how much time we have for, is it 10 years, 30 years, you know. So I would say, do what you love. Like, as you're a teacher, you have the capacity to reach other students. Um, 
and be a role model for like love of the land and appreciation of diversity you can like especially because of like the teacher shortage and teacher quitting now in a sense when you're teaching now you i think you can more incorporate things and kind of tell people the bullshit about like you know standardized testing and like careerism and it's a balance right like we're all living in two worlds we're living in the world that's now and we're living in the world that's coming and we're going right now through this transition so i'd say if you as long as you find teaching joyous which is why i i hope you got into it to begin with like stay the course you know find find that find ways to be a meaningful advocate in your classrooms and uh and in your own life though don't neglect uh as you often close with get out there enjoy and have a good time like it's a, it's a balance right i don't think i mean hedonism has its has its fun but it, even full-time hedonism can kind of get boring you want to mix it up so yeah always set so time aside to find things and and focus on the simpler joys right like a friendship and music and games um cooking uh gardening because that is the future right that's like for, for those of us that are lucky enough to make it through the bottleneck you know it's we're going to make it through going back to this kind of 19th century or earlier ways of living and uh why not embrace that now because that's usually what brings people happiness now in here right like like who is really happy like fooling around on their phone and social media right it's designed to actually to make you unhappy and hook you into cycles of dependence where you keep going on for the dopamine hit so yeah i would say yeah so stay the course we don't know how long things are last but even if things last short like whatever years you can be a a, a powerful advocate for your future students like it's, a, it's been meaningful for me so i, I would hope it's meaningful for them too all right i never heard mad max anywhere in that answer but, uh, <laughs> we don't have enough time that will be a uh that will be another. Well, here's the, so, for another well, I'll just time, briefly right? say on the Mad Max. Remember, Mad Max, they're all using oil, right? Yeah. So, like, <laughs> yes, Mad Max possibility, but it'd be a short period, right? Because once the oil runs out, like the 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 range of of the wandering hordes is very short. Like, it's a short range. So, if, if you're not if you're living away from urban population centers, like, yeah, and you've got yourself a doomsday somewhere with uh, like-minded community members. Uh, by the way, dentists, we're looking for future dentists for the future community doomsday. <laughs> Um, yeah, then I think, you know, they won't, the, the Mad Max horse won't reach you because the oil will run out. How That's get what the James Tower Consular is counting on. I, <laughs> I hope he's right. So, anyway, well, guys, I think we are running out of time and we will see.